Hello, this is Miss Kyler, and I'm glad to be here to talk to you about The Island of Dr. Moreau, one of my favorite novels. It's written by H.G. Wells in 1896. It's a real page-turner. In fact, once you start reading it, it's really hard to put it down. You're wondering what's going to happen and what's really going on on that mysterious island. Also, some of the greatest description you'll ever read. H.G. Wells was pretty phenomenal for his time. He not only was revolutionary at, at in the 1800s and early 1900s with his thinking, but also many of his ideas have actually been acted upon and used to um, further science. In fact, he, it has been said that he even predicted World War II. First of all, I'd like you to note the newspaper-like tone, very different than the um, the very over-the-top sort of gothic literature we were used to from the romantic period. It's much more realistic. Also, um, these stories would be um, read chapter by chapter in different editions of the newspaper. So each new newspaper that would come out, they would look for that little section and continue to read the, the, um, the novel. So it wasn't read, just sit down, open the book. And that would also lead to the fact that you would think of it as more real because it's in a newspaper. So people found it was very credible and it's, using, and it's also discussing scientific phenomena, which makes it much more believable. Another thing that adds to its believability is the fact that he sets it just about 10 years prior to publication. So it's so near and so real that people might find it more believable. In fact, he uses the same technique in War of the Worlds, which is about attack from Mars. Okay, so um, in the second chapter, the one after the introduction, it starts, there's a section where the ship crashes and he's left floating at sea with some sailors. And finally, one of the characters, Helmer, proposes that they decide which one of them is going to be left alive to eat the, have the rest of the water and the food. And so the lot fell upon the sailor, but he was the strongest of us all and would not abide by it and attacked Helmer with his hands. They grappled together. Well, we know that what happens is that they both end up destroying each other, leaving our protagonist to survive. But this is definitely going along with what was happening in the scientific world of the time. The theory of evolution was pervading scientific society, and along with that was the philosophy of Nietzsche, who really proposed, was a proponent of the idea of the stronger over the weaker. And society at large began to question the Bible and seek life's answers in science and philosophy rather than in religion. Survival of the fittest is a definite theme in the chapter titled In the Dinghy of the Lady Bane, which is a little uh, snippet there is from. The struggle to survive the shipwreck, this is actually foreshadowing the continuing struggle to gain dominance that occurs throughout the novel. How to, you know, the powerful over the weak. And some of the questions that H.E. Wells raises are, who is the fittest, man or animal? Because Nietzsche would suggest that as you go up the scale, you know, animals are the bottom, and then you go up and you find this superior, strong superman who is really the one that <laughs> should subjugate all others. And that was actually what um, the Nazis clutched a hold of and used as their one of their mantras. But H.G. Wells questions, who is more humane, man or animal? Or perhaps is each man really an animal deep inside? And chapter two, The Man Who's Going Nowhere, we meet Montgomery. And here are some clips that um, we're going to look at. But I want you to um, kind of look at Montgomery. He's a very interesting character. He's sort of a weak, the ner weak nervous assistant. He's the one that only one that actually shows compassion in the story. And it, but it has been suggested that Montgomery is really a homosexual. Now this is from that some of those you know little hints in the story where he mentions some districts in London, Tottenham Court Road and Gower Street, that were known for being hangouts for homosexuals. Plus the fact that he lisps, it says down here, he spoke with a slobbering articulation with a ghost of a lisp, which is kind of a stereotypical linguistic pattern often associated with homosexuals. Another thing is the fact that he talks about music halls. Very often homosexuals like to hang out at music halls and see female impersonators, etc. 
And then he said he made a young ass of himself, which made it, mean, means I made a young fool of myself when he says that. So he did something that made it impossible for him to stay in the society. Of course, homosexuality was against the rules. In fact, um, Oscar, Oscar Wilde was put in jail because it was found out that he was a homosexual. Now, this, there is, throughout the story, this juxtaposition or the fact that they connect two things that don't necessarily always go together, but they always connect Montgomery with the beast men. And he always has a uh, sort of sympathy for the beast men, aligning himself with them. And this kind of conveys the attitude society had towards homosexuals as abnormal outsiders. He's one of them. That, that's a part of society that we, we try to pretend does not exist. They live in the shadows at night, and we hide that over with our glossy um, forefront. Um, now, the idea that there's continual growing fear is important. And so it's always this continual struggle. Again, the survival of the fittest sort of thing. And as the novel progresses, we see the protagonist growing more and more fearful of different things. First, he's afraid of the unknown. What's going to happen to me? What's going on here? Then he starts becoming more fearful of the savagery of the animals that are attacking him. And then he becomes you know, afraid and appalled by the savagery of mankind. And then he's afraid of the weakness, and his own weakness, of the domination of man, when he, you see Moreau there with his whip. And then the fear of himself and his fellow men in society, especially at the end. He starts realizing if this thing is happening on this island, then maybe it's happening in our society as well. Now, as you read, I want you to take note of the things that trigger his fears. When is he the strongest and when is he the weakest? And think about you know, this in uh, conjunction with the idea of science, of evolution, of the philosophy of the time, um, man and superman, survival of the fittest, and see what connections you can make. Now, they talk a lot about vivisection in this novel. If you've ever read Robert Louis Stevenson's The Body Snatchers, which was written about 10 years earlier, you know that dissection of corpses was frowned upon for a long time. They were called grave robbers. These were people that were paid to steal corpses from graveyards to enable medical students to study human anatomy. Of course, if you wanted to study something that was still beating, like a beating heart or a brain that was still operating, you had to do vivisection, which is dissection of a living thing. And this was being practiced on animals. And of course, this time, you know, animal protection societies were becoming very prominent in society. And so this, this practice was much frowned upon. And the protagonist thinks this is the extent of Moreau's secret experiment, not realizing that the vivisection is not just for scientific um, discovery, but actually he's doing something else. Now, there's another thing. So we talk about animals and we talk about humanity. And so if you've ever taken a humanities class, you know that it explores what distinguishes human beings from animals. It's always a question that has um, intrigued hum people. And here are some suggestions that have been put forward. So some people say religion. You know, only people would have an organized religion with various rules to follow and a higher being to worship. Philosophy, the idea that we want to think higher than just the immediate, we need this, we need that. Appreciation of art and music. Complex storytelling, being able to tell what happened in the past, what, happened in the, what could happen in the future. And interpretation of symbols is a big one. The ability to associate a concrete object like a flag, for example, with an abstract concept like patriotism. So you could say, I see a flag, instead of just saying, oh, flag. We say flag and we think of all sorts of concepts like patriotism, freedom, liberty, etc. Now, as you read the novel, explore whether or not Moreau's animals participate in any of these and to what extent. Do they have any type of religion or way of thinking or philosophy? Uh, do they seem to appreciate art, music, complex storytelling, etc.? Are they more animal or human? And what makes Moreau, the protagonist of Montgomery, different from the animals? Okay. Okay, so the message at the end is look to the stars. The protagonist returns and he resorts to astronomy to escape his fear of the animalistic nature of his fellow human beings. 
And so stargazing from the earliest times is pretty interesting. It's linked to the realization of man's smallness, this idea that you look up and you see this expanse, huge outer space, and you all of a sudden realize Earth itself is just a little small thing, and me, I'm just a little tiny part of this. And if I'm so small, there must be something much bigger than me in control of this whole thing. It's also about predicting and wondering about the future, you know, the idea of astrology and using stars to guide you, not only in um, your traveling and discoveries of the world itself, but also you know, using it to guide your um, life choices. Okay, so that ending kind of segues neatly into the next novel he would write, which would be War of the Worlds. And there is a picture from an early edition, 1906, of the War of the Worlds with a tripod and its laser ray that destroys everything in its path. So this is kind of ironic because the ending, he's finding solace in astronomy, losing himself in the contemplation of Pope in outer space. Yeah, that kind of makes you think. Um, uh, here comes War of the Worlds, 1897, to elute disillusioned readers. So here we think we're going to escape the savagery and the inhumanity of mankind by going into outer space. But what if the creatures from outer space are more brutal, more sadistic, more cold-hearted than anything we had even thought of? So even the final frontier brings fear and destruction in this sort of scientific view of life. Hope you enjoy the island of Dr. Moreau.